Hello, everybody. Welcome to Academic Women Reclaim Your Power Towards an Entrepreneurial You, Tapping into the Strengths You Already Have as an Academic Women. And so I'm so excited that all of you are here. I want to introduce our panelists, and this is going to be the order that they're going to talk. There's Dr. Gina Holmes, who is a doctoral mentor, and she is going to talk about identifying the strengths you already have. There's Tanya White, who has her own business called Heart and Soul Wealth, and she's going to be talking about bank code, which is a little quiz that you can take that will help you communicate more effectively. And there's me, Dr. Gina Petnito of Academic Women Reclaim Your Power and Writing Your Way, and I'm going to talk a little bit about marshalling the resources you have to start your side business. So take it away, Gina. Hey, thank you, Gina. This is, I, since I started this business, I've like met so many people who are Gina's and I've never met Gina's before in my life. It's really weird. So this is, this is great. So all, I just wanna talk a little bit about how we make the move from being an academic, which can be a very disempowering environment and a very um, disencouraging environment as well, into an environment where you've actually got to be an absolute tiger in terms of representing yourself and knowing what your strengths are and how you can use those. And I found that that was quite a big learning curve, but I think it's a really important one to have. I've spent many years, I'm now well over 20 years in higher education, teaching uh, everything from foundation level, which in the UK is the year below undergraduate entry, to, um, well, doctoral students. Now I spend all of my time virtually supervising people doing doctorates, um, particularly deep profs, professional doctorates and PhDs. And I've spent a lot of that time as well supporting undergraduates into employment and seeing the transition from the study environment to the work environment. So it was interesting when I decided to become the, the entrepreneurial academic, the journey that I took through that. And really, so I just thought it would be really useful to talk you through that and, and to share some of those lessons with you. Feel free to jump in and make comments. I, I much prefer people talking to me than just talking to a screen. Now, we all know this feeling of like looking at the little black spot on, on the screen. So do jump in and let me know your experiences as well. I will start by saying that I think um, I'm looking at another screen over here. So bear with me whilst I do this. Um, really, we're talking about two separate things here. The first one is the academic entrepreneurship. And you, if you Google that term, you'll find again thousands and thousands of articles around how to be an academic entrepreneur and the basic definition of that is that someone who takes what they do in the lab or in the academic practice and uses that to create a business which spreads the message more widely when i was um, first starting teaching in a university we used to joke I would have the nine o'clock on a Thursday morning slot, which was the biggest lecture in the entire university. I had over 400 undergraduates on the same, pro the same in the same hour, in the same room. And we were starting to come under pressure to publish at that point. And we used to say, don't really know why you want us to publish, because if you want us to have impact, then we're much better in front of this group of 400 people teaching them and then going out and teaching other people what, what we've taught them. Because in terms of numbers of impact, that's much, much higher than us publishing a paper which is maybe read by 10 people in a year. But that's not really how our, our masters saw it. And so we duly did the, the writing bit as well. And it wasn't something I really enjoyed. Now, to take that message that we had then and make it more widely available, but through a process of being monetized to make a living from it, which some of you have mentioned already, is probably a much better way of getting the messages out there than actually publishing them in academic papers. It depends what you want to do, right? So if you really love being in that environment of, of writing papers and the conference rounds, I mean, they're getting less frequent now, so certainly in my place, the conference funding isn't there anymore. 
Um, but you know, that sort of that writing, that sharing academic knowledge, and it depends on your field as well, can be a very fun place to be. If you're in sciences, it's very common. If you're in the humanities, it's very common to, to generate work through, through that and to generate your, your views and then share them widely. But in fields like business, it's very hard to get your ideas published and to, to share them anywhere that matters. Much better, I think, to take what you know and actually be really honest about what you're doing and say, right, I'm going to go and make a business from this and I can share it and I can help people through it. In my own case, and I'll talk a little bit about this later on, but I, I actually have two businesses. I uh, never want to do anything by halves. So I've been introduced as a doctoral mentor and the, uh, which is taking what I do with doctoral students and trying to make the journey easier. Uh, in, in my experience, the, the doctoral students that I saw struggle not so much with the supervision, hopefully my, my supervision is a lot better than that, which I received, but um, with the, the processes, the bureaucracy, all the stuff behind it that makes the journey so long and the, the, the inevitable rabbit holes that people disappear down and get encouraged to disappear down. And I wanted to take some of that complication out. So I don't supervise people through my business, but I mentor and support and train people to look for the quick and easy ways through. And particularly for women who are doing doctorates with, with family, with jobs, with all the other demands, with the emotional labour, that really does make a big difference to, to their journey. And I, I've been getting people through in 12 to 18 months less than they anticipated taking, simply because we've taken the complications and the, the, the circuitous routes out. The other thing that I'm doing is I have a software business, which I can't talk about because it's currently in development and therefore we're embargoed, but we will be building, we are building a software which we'll be launching hopefully early part of next year. Now, I don't recommend doing two businesses at the same time because it is a little bit chaotic, especially when you're working for two universities as well. Um, but they are quite similar in the, the skills that they demand. So what so I'm here to talk about, how do we identify the skills that we can use? I think the thing that is really, really interesting in the first instance for me was really getting into who I am, what I love doing and what I got feedback from other people on me being good at. So I listened very carefully to what other people told me or what other people said about me for quite a while before I did this. Um, I, I'm a natural supporter, I'm a natural cheerleader, I'm somebody that listens, I'm incredibly intuitive, I can, I can see underneath people's skin straight away, I can pick up issues from people. And that was something that was very important to me, I'm also values driven, and that was very important to me as well. So understanding really how I work was part of a big part of the choices to make and with a software that's much more difficult to do but it's still coming through very much in how we're designing the software and the kind of business model that we're taking with that um, but with the doctoral mentoring then it's very much about the way that I'm working with people the chances that I give people to explore how to find their solutions, how to support them, the kind of the models that I make in terms of the way I, I deliver services and offerings. Um, and really building those businesses in line with my own strengths. I think when you have the opportunity to design whatever you want to do, I mean, entrepreneurship is about building the business that you want. It's not about someone else's model you don't have to do what someone else tells you just because someone else says they're making seven figures and you, you want to go there doesn't mean you have to use their model you can do it your own way and there's you know, thousands of people out there who will tell you all about the different ways that they've done that but i think it's as academics we can be very good at going oh let's have a look at this critically let's just think about the way that we can do this the best let's find the most efficient solution when actually it's got to feel right for you some of the other sort of skills that I picked up as being really important is curiosity. And we're very good as academics at finding things that are interesting. We wouldn't be doing the research and the work that we do if we weren't interested in the subject, if we weren't interested in how things work, how people work, how things change. And we're very good at asking the questions. 
So asking those questions and building a business model which allows us to ask the questions that we like asking is really important. Obviously, being able to talk to people and having people's skills is important. And if you're going to do anything other than build a fully passive income business, you need to be able to deal with people. Now, most of us as academics can deal with people, do deal with people, whether those are students or colleagues or peers. But it's worth, I think, having a really good look at the ways you like dealing with people. I love being in front of a big group of people. I love in-person connection. I love the teaching. I love, you know, seeing the whites of their eyes and watching the lights go on. And for me, that was a really important part of what I do. So I'm coming under some pressure from other people around me. And you know, that happens all the time in business to put courses together and just sell courses and just you know put courses up and offer them. And it's a great model and I love the idea, but I don't want to be that disconnected from my clients. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's a way I will go, but it's about finding ways to deliver those courses and those trainings and those learnings that includes the personal connection. And I think understanding that about myself has been key to me really enjoying the first, the, the months this year when I've been running this business, because I've got to know really interesting people. I've been able to spend time with people who are doing things that I love doing and to watch them grow and develop. And without that, I would struggle. So really understanding how you like dealing with people, not just that you can deal with people, that you can sell, that you can negotiate, or that you can protect your own boundaries. Those are vitally important, but also about what is it I really like about the people side. And if I don't like the people side, then yeah, go down the passive route. Absolutely. You've got the option to do that, which you haven't so much when you're working in academia, I think. I think one of the other things that's important is examining not just your own subject knowledge, but the way that your subject knowledge interacts with the potential audience that you want to talk to. You will know whether you are interested in working just with women, just with students, just with professionals, um, with young males who are having a hard time with a particular issue, there, there will be niches that you're interested in. How does what you want to do interact with that group? So I have a friend who is a, an English scholar. Her specialism is children's literature and particularly the Harry Potter novels. Who knew? It's a thing. Now, we were talking a while ago about how she could monetize that and how she could do that, how she could use that as a way to build a business. You know, and there's, there's a whole fan club out, niche out there of, of people around this, this very important genre, but the children's fantasy genre is slightly bigger. So she's kind of gone down that route of looking at how she can talk to people in the children's fantasy area and really enjoy what they want and delivering that to them. And I think that is really important that you understand how your subject area or what you want to do can be useful to your people. You know, I looked at all of my skills and I, I've got first degree in economics, a second degree in human resource management, a PhD in, in management studies. Um, I've worked in engineering schools. I've worked in agricultural engineering. I've worked in manufacturing. I've worked in banking. I probably could do a lot of things. But the thing that's always really lit me up is that kind of that one to one working with people and really supporting and seeing my students really develop. So for me, understanding what my subject area is and how I like working with people has led to the model that I have now. Now, it's not for everyone. It's very niche. Um, but it is something that is working because I know very deeply the things I need to know in there. But also that model works for me very well. The other things, very things that I think as academics we're very good at doing, but you maybe need to look at your own ways of, of dealing with those issues. How persistent and resilient are you? If you're surviving in academia, you are resilient by nature, because it can be, we know it can be a challenging place to be. But how do you deal with that resilience? How are you able to pick yourself up and brush yourself off? Think about that and about how 
you would do that in an environment where you don't have people around you all the time. Um, and how flexible are you? You know, sometimes the first plan doesn't work. So are you able to let go of one idea and move on to the next? I've had to do that a couple of times and it's hard. It's hard when you trash the website that you work so hard on and move on to another one. Um, but sometimes we have to do that and just let go. So it, it, think about what are the, your approaches to those things, to the resilience, the persistence, to keeping going, to getting up. Are you happy to work on your own? Or do you need people around you? Um, and then I think, you know, what do you do? That What do you do? I mean, if we talk about finding the skills to, to identifying the skills, identifying your strengths, but what do you actually love to do? It doesn't have to be an academic discipline, does it? I've got academic friends who run businesses about crocheting. Um, and they bring their skills as academics, those critical thinking, personal interaction, teaching skills to something that is non-academic in its content. And they do very well. So it doesn't have to be. You could, you know, go off to, to sports, you could go off to 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 photography. It doesn't, it not that that isn't academic as well, but that you could do that, you could bring your own interests in. So don't be limited as an academic by what you do in your day job. That's really my, my key point from that. And if you think about some people who, some academics that we know who've taken their own learnings, their own research, we think about Brene Brown, okay? She's clearly taken some very academic research and made it accessible to people who are not academics and made a very successful business from that. The way that she's done it through talking to people, through teaching off the stage. It was that TEDx talk, that, that, that the TED talk that really made her, um, and then the books that she writes. So there's are academic skills that she's used in a way which brings her learning, her research to the wider audience. That's a, a different model to the one that I'm using, um, but again, she's been very successful. If I can get half as successful as her, then I'll be happy. And mm. um, so, yeah. So then how do you monetize it? You start slow, you, you start, you start. We're very good, I think, as academics, at looking at something and just analyzing all the angles and looking at all the issues and planning it to the nth degree. The thing I've learned, I've learned it the hard way, is that you've just got to start, you've just got to do it, you've just got to accept imperfect action and keep rolling with it. And that you try, 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 experiment and keep trying and we'll see where we go. Um, and then, yeah, so that's, um, I think, pretty much what I would say as the first instance. Now I have, bear with me two seconds. Try it together for you, which is there. So if you fancy having a few looks at my thoughts, then they are there and feel free to sign up and get that. That'll be delivered straight down to you. Um, I'm very happy to discuss that. I know I'm going to make space for other people to talk. So, yeah, please um, let me know your thoughts and happy to, to carry on the conversation when it's appropriate. Okay, thank you so much, Gina. You know, there was going to be a third Gina coming on. Uh, she had registered, you know, but I don't, I don't see her here. But I said the same thing to her. I'm so glad to meet another Gina when I first met her. I met her uh, long before this. Okay, so now we're gonna turn things over to Tanya. Tanya just has like a heart because she enjoyed Gina's talk. So Tanya is gonna talk about how we can use our communication styles to communicate with people like us and not like us. Exactly, so good morning. Well, good morning here. I'm in California, so it's Pacific <laughs> time. So it's only not quite 9.30 in the morning here. Um, and it sounds like you guys are probably coming from all parts of the world. So um, yeah, communication is so, so important. Um, and I heard like Lauren talk about um, really wanting to start into the diversity and inclusion area, um, either as her own consultant or getting on board with a company. Lena chimed in to say, hey, I'm interested in that too, when she typed it into the chat. And so regardless of whether you're looking to get a job um, and working for someone 
or starting your own consulting business or something similar of where you're going to be starting a community and or, um, you know, also starting your business to gather clients. Communication is important in all aspects of that and how we are coming across. And I think um, Gina sent out in one of the email communications an assessment that you can take. It's like a very quick assessment and it's based on your values. It's a personality assessment, but unlike other personality assessments like DISC or MBTI, which is focused on your own personality, it does incorporate that, but it but it's really more about how to communicate with others, especially given your style of communication. So I'm gonna do a screen share here because I do have a few slides that I wanted to share with you guys. Here we go. So on this why we buy, part of it relates to a sales environment, but really anything that we are trying to propose, whether it's a proposal to a company, um, negotiating with a spouse or partner or getting the kids to clean up their room or eat their vegetables, <laughs> all of that falls under like getting people to buy into what it is that we're wanting to communicate, what it is that we're, you know, wanting to share and oftentimes for their own benefit. And so buying yes can be from a sales perspective, but it's also from the perspective of having people you know, come into our world, but we have to be able to communicate it in a certain way. And so I'm going to talk on a very, very high level because we only have 15 minutes, the secrets, the science, the system, and the solution for, for influencing, you know, garnering a higher level of influence with others. Um, this QR code that's right here that you can use the QR code to take that assessment as well. And I'll share it again towards the end. So this is a little bit about me. I'm not in academia, but I you know, have gone through the process on the student side. I've attained my MBA and then I have a variety of certifications, et cetera. My primary business is actually as a financial advisor, but I started a financial education and coaching business um, right around the time that I had met Gina um, Penotino. Peno, sorry. Gina. <laughs> Gina. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Get tongue tied there. And so, um, yeah. And so it's really, yeah. So I have a variety of you know, educational background, but not from a professor standpoint, but I have led workshops, obviously very different um, than teaching in academia. And so with this personality science, you know, it's really about what triggers the yes or the no in a decision-making process. And this whole system was created by um, a woman by the name of Sherry Tree of Codebreaker Technologies. So it's personality-based, people focus and also profit driven. And the idea is to help you be able to be up to 300% more effective in your communication and in less time using the powerful skills of the basically cracking what was called cracking your code. And it's a value-based process. And this was this, this was Basically, the idea is that sales really is not a numbers game. It's a people game. And knowing and learning about the personality science behind it, which dates back actually two and a half thousand years to Hippocrates, the father of medicine. And he made the theory famous when re he realized that there's basically four elements, four different groups, which is under the theory of the four temperaments. And each of them being very, very different. And then personality science, when we talk about the DISC program or the MBTI, and even this program is really based on the original theory of Hippocrates. And so when we look at this, you know, N being very nurturing, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, K for knowledge, B for blueprint, and A for action. And all of these four different primary codes, there are different things that will trigger them for a yes or a no. And when we are our own selves, if we're speaking in our own personality, somebody else who ha also has that primary code will be able to understand us very well and very succinctly. But if we're speaking to somebody in a different code, 
that's where we can have a mismatch of communication. And so it's really about how to um, be more effective in that process. So when we're speaking to our own code, we're delivering the right script about 25% of the time, but if we're using that same languaging, the same behaviors, and when we're speaking to the other codes, we will be wrong 75% of the time because we're not speaking in their language. And so if we think of the B for blueprint, and we consider that to be English, for example, just as a, a linguistic um, example here. So for speaking to others in English, they will understand what we're saying. But if we're speaking in English, but this person is hearing in, let's say, Spanish, and we're not speaking in Spanish, and they don't speak English, we're not going to be very effective with that. But if we begin to learn to speak in their language, you know, they will certainly appreciate and be able to recognize what we are saying. And then if we consider the end for Chinese, if we're speaking in, in English, of course, they're not going to be able to understand what we're saying. And so as we learn to be able to speak in these different languages, based on personality, we increase the impact that we're having, whether it relates to sales or simply influence and wanting to be able to communicate in terms of, like I said, proposals or speaking with clients to, or potential clients to have them come into our world because we know that we can help them. So it's really about, this whole concept is about making people matter, speaking in their own language so we can be more effective in the process, unlocking their personality code. And so B for blueprint, what are some characteristics of the B? So characteristics of the B is, and I and that code that I gave at the beginning, it's a digital version. There's actually physical cards um, as well. And so some of the characteristics of the physical card, so a blueprint personality, it's a very stable. Stability is important to them and structure. Systems, processes, and planning. Predictability. And so as we're speaking to somebody who is a blueprint, um, they're also very, very professional. They tend to be very conservative in their dress, oftentimes wearing blue as a color or dark gray or black. For them, precision is key. So you want to be early with this person. And being on time means 15 to 20 minutes. That's on time for them. If you want to be early, it's actually arriving 30 minutes in advance. And if you actually arrive before they arrive, they will be very impressed by that. You want to provide them with references. Show them the systems for success. Um, so if you are... Um, in a coaching or even the diversity and inclusion that several people are looking at, show them the big picture of what that means to be successful on that track and um, they will very much appreciate it and showing them the step-by-step -step process with that. So those are some of the things with the blueprint personality. Action is almost complete opposite. <laughs> um, from an action person, what's important to them is freedom, flexibility, spontaneity, um, opportunity, excitement, attention, competition, and winning. And so if you, if you have people in your world that you are wanting to garner who is an action type personality, and this may not be your personality. For me, for me it's like, the, and we have all of these, but to varying degrees. Um, but for me, action is my lowest. So I really have to try hard when I'm speaking with an action person and knowing that, um, like, so for me, my primary code is knowledge. Um, and I tend to be very detailed and giving a lot of information because I um, want to make sure that they have everything. But for an action person, that is like, ah, <laughs> don't give me all the information, just bullet point, bottom line, I don't want to read long emails, um, that type of thing. And so other things um, that they want to have fun, being cool, like if you can connect them to like the VIP experience and or VIP people, that's important for an action person just as a high level. Now nurturing, the nurturing person. Um, relationships and authenticity is hugely, hugely important for somebody who is high in nurturing, whether it's their primary code or their secondary code. 
Personal growth and development is also important for a nurturing person. Um, teamwork, being significant, leaving a legacy, leaving an impact, all of these are important for somebody who is high in nurturing, as well as having a harmonious um, environment. And so to create community for this person um, is very important to them. And so in your process of speaking with the nurturing person of wanting to garner their, um, their buy-in, you wanna be very authentic and transparent with them. Show them that you care more about them than than what it is that your objective might be, whether it's from a sales perspective or um, whatever it is that you're wanting from them, show them that you care more about them than whatever that objective is. And that you're passionate about the causes um, that they are, um, that are important to them. So that is very important for the nurturing person. For the knowledge person, um, so for the knowledge person, some key values for them are learning, intelligence, logic. If they could, if you think of, um, if you guys are, have ever watched Star Trek, <laughs> if you can think of Data or Spock, <laughs> depending on which version of Star Trek, if you could, if they could plug in a USB in the back of their head and just have all of this information downloaded <laughs> into them, that would be the ultimate for a K. <laughs> and where data and processing, self-mastery, technology, um, universal truths and science. And so for this person who is high in K or K as their primary, you wanna provide them with resources, case studies, documentation. You wanna know your information because they will call you on it. They, they are the person that will ask you a ton of questions because they want to understand the whole big picture. This person, as well as the blueprints too, but they can take longer in their process because they want to evaluate everything. And it might be somewhat annoying for somebody who's not a K or if you're very low in, in that knowledge piece, but it, as you're starting to work and develop these processes for your own, you want to keep track of the documentation of that because that will be important for the K person to know the ins and outs of everything and stay very logical. Both the K knowledge person as well as the blueprint um, they are very reserved, and so there, there's not going to be a lot of excitement that they are exuding in the process, and if you're overly excited, that's actually going to be a huge turn off for them, and so, um, you know, that's kind of the, um, the overview of the high-level, high-level, high-level overview of these different personality types. So, so far I have cracked 234 codes of people who have come into my world. And this is the breakdown of what that looked like. About 40% of them were their primary code. Their first primary code was nurturing. Um, second, about 40% of the people in my world. 25% um, of them is the second level of action. Um, 23%, so very close um, to knowledge and blueprint 12% so far. And as time goes on, that might change a little bit, but that's so far for the people. And so um, in this process, so as I got introduced to the bank system, um, it was to look at how I can be more effective in my communication, more so for one-on-one -on -one coaching as I start that process. But I'm actually going through, um, I went through their certification program and I'm actually auditing it right now. And it's really opening up my, my whole world because one of the things that we talked about like a week ago, um, there's like six different intelligence. We went through emotional intelligence, artificial intelligence. Last week was business intelligence or sales intelligence, personality intelligence. But when we started to talk about the business intelligence, it was, okay, well, Okay, so I see my codes, 234 codes cracked, and this is the makeup of them. But okay, so from there, what are the primary codes that are, what are the codes of the people who are actually taking advantage of my offer? And what are the personality codes of those that go to the next step and the next step? And are there variances between them? And so as I start to look at more data, this is data that I can incorporate because it can also track where do I wanna put my marketing dollars? 
you know, are, are there certain events or certain associations that I might be more effective in attracting if I know the bank code of certain um, person and certain personality types, I can be more effective and not have to waste so much money by trying all of these different things, not really knowing, just kind of like throwing spaghetti on the wall in terms of what's going to be effective or not. And as we're starting as entrepreneurs, we don't have a lot of money to waste and just willy nilly spending money here, there and everywhere. And so as we're developing our, our client avatar, the bank code piece is going to be a critical piece um, I have found because I can be more effective in my communication with them. And there's an artificial intelligence that I can, so with my website, for example, I ran it through the artificial intelligence to see, okay, who am I who would, would be most attracted to, and I'm trying to keep it fairly even, but it ends up actually being a little bit more nurturing. And with my LinkedIn profile, any anything that I have there out in social media, the posts that I'm writing, I can throw it through into AI. And people have actually, we have some of the coaches that have actually put through their whole book through the artificial intelligence to see how am I communicating? How who is it attracting, who it might not be attracting? How do I make some changes if I want it to be fairly even to where if I want to talk across all codes or do I really wanna specify and target in at certain codes? And that way I might want to tweak my language. So the artificial intelligence is helping me as an assistant be able to be more effective in my written communications and my verbal communications, depending on who it is that I'm speaking to, which is really cool, which is really cool. And so what is your bank code? So, you know, again, in the email that Gina sent, she invited you to be able to get your own bank code and you will actually get a really, really cool report that not only, which is a $99 value, not only talk about your own personality, but it will give you tips on how to communicate with somebody who's high in any of the other codes that aren't your primary code because you can speak like English to English with your primary code, but anyone outside of that, there will be things that will be a turn on for them. And there are definitely, definitely things that will be a turn off for them that you might have no clue about <laughs> until you get this report, which is really cool. It's a really awesome thing. And it takes like 90 seconds or less to be able to do that because you're just looking at these values cards and putting them in order based on what's most important to you, second, you know, third and fourth, however that works out. And so again, um, and it's really the whole idea is being able to communicate in a way that others would appreciate you taking the time to be able to speak to things that are important to them. And that really is the whole idea around it, making other people matter. So it's kind of like that golden rule, but not so much do unto others as you would have them do unto you, but how they would want something done unto them. And because that not may not necessarily be a match with how you want to be communicated with. And so it's really raising our emotional in intelligence in all aspects of our lives, be it professional, be it personal, as we're speaking even with our partners, with our children and with friends and family, it really goes beyond in all aspects of our lives. And that was the end. So there we go. Thank you so much, Tanya. You're welcome. I'll stop and, screen share. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you so much. That was so informative. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen and um, move to the next one. I'm going to just present a lot of very practical tips on marshalling the resources you already have to start your side business. And I have talked about this before. Um, if you are um, uh, on my mailing list already, I sent you a PDF on it, um, on finding your why. Um, and that's the first step as an entrepreneur um, and as an academic woman who wants to be an entrepreneur is find your why. Now, I actually found my why in 2019 when I had no idea that I would be leaving academia. I was reading um, Simon Sinek. You can also get his book and read it. 
And I did a little workshop with somebody, it took us four hours where we followed his entire protocol and we talked to each other and um, she helped me find my why and I helped her find her why. Um, basically your why is your purpose and what it is that you want to do with your life. What do you want to accomplish? And for me as an academic, I discovered that I really enjoyed helping my students succeed. I really got a charge out of seeing their success. And I was an academic for about 40 years. And so I've seen two generations of uh, young people grow up and become adults and have successful lives. And just the knowledge that I knew that I was somehow involved in their success. And this started me on my first business, which is Writing Your Way, where I initially focused on middle and high school students and helping them write, even though I'm a sociologist, I've been a writer all my life, and um, helping them develop their common application essay for entrance into university. Um, but then I started thinking, and it wasn't very long after I started writing your way that I started thinking, um, it was COVID time. There were a lot of academic women that were losing their jobs. And I'm saying, I am going to use my experience to help academic women find their success. So that you can see this, this notion of really getting excited about other people's success helped me decide the direction that I wanted to go as an entrepreneur. Okay, so whatever it is your why, um, if you haven't gotten my little PDF, I can send it out to you again, or you can read Simon Sinek, or you could go on YouTube. There's tons of stuff that you can do to find your why, but I think really that's the very first step for any entrepreneur. Then you want to decide on a product or service for your business. Now, um, I did have four academic women who were spotlighted, and we learned a little something different from each one. Um, and one of our academic women, her name was Fatima M. Lemdi, she started out wanting to be um, a health and wellness coach. And she couldn't find tons of success doing that. One day, she went to a party, I think it was a Christmas party, with a tray, you know, a potluck, and they all got excited over her beautiful tray. And she then started a charcuterie business. I just learned how to pronounce that word myself. And so you have to be a little flexible in terms of what exactly it is that you want to do. That you could be a person that's selling products, or you could be a person that is selling services, or a whole bunch of other stuff in between. But you can make those initial decisions, and that doesn't necessarily mean you're wedded to them. Then you want to decide on the population you want to serve, and that, of course, is your avatar or the, the client. There's tons of stuff out there on finding your client avatar, okay? And you want to know as much about your client as you possibly can. I don't think that I've been in a business program yet that has not said, go out and talk to people who are your potential clients and find out what it is that they're thinking about and what it is that they are hoping and dreaming of. Okay, uh, strength number one, right? Most academics are researchers in one way or another. I happen to be a qualitative researcher and some of them talk about doing surveys. Well, what I did was I just made Zoom calls and started talking to people using my qualitative interviewing expertise. I mean, you don't have to reinvent, reinvent um, the wheel here. You already have a lot that you bring to the table. So those are the first three. Once you decide on these three, it will help you chart your course and help you to take those initial steps into your side business. Now, this one was ideas that I got from my one of my current clients and also from the people that I interviewed. All of them were all um, 
all academics who then became entrepreneurs and those videos are available on my channel. But here's the obvious, tuition remission. How many people do we know that took advantage of the free tuition available to them as an academic and got the skills that they needed to start a new career? There's somebody that I know personally that became a career uh, um, a counselor. He got a got a some sort of psychology degree. Um, but you can, the sky is basically the limit in terms of what it is that you could do. Now, as I was looking at the list, I was realizing that some people are not uh, academics right now and that they may not have access to tuition remission, but use your knowledge about the academy to find other op op uh, options. I have a master's degree in gerontology. I got my master's degree in 1980. And I always knew about college courses for seniors. So what I did just a couple of days ago is I started looking for college courses for seniors that are available in my area. And lo and behold, I found a, a free tuition for anybody 60 and older at The Ohio State University. Now I haven't signed up yet, but I'm starting to think about taking a business course. So you could take a course in entrepreneurship, a course in marketing, um, any type of courses like this that would expand your knowledge or however it is that you want your knowledge to be expanded um, as an academic. So that's just one thing that I knew that I tapped into and I found a resource available to me. Now, the not so obvious, but why not? And again, this is from some of the people that I talked to, using professional development funds for your business. Now, of course, you have to make sure that you follow the rules and regulations. I'm not telling you to lie because that's not the person that I am. In most of the cases, the people that I knew that use professional development funds for their side business asked permission and told them what they were hoping to use it for. And they were given permission, right? Here's an example. Instead of saying, I'm gonna publish that book by very small academic press that's gonna be read by three people who are doing their dissertation sometime in 2035, I'm going to write a book that will be uh, for a lot of different people to read and you can think of this book as a lead magnet for your business, or you can just think of it as social proof. And social proof is information that's out there on the internet that demonstrates to potential clients that you have what it takes to help them. The other thing you can do is rather than say, okay, well, I have conference travel money, right? say, I'm going to use this money, instead of going to a conference, go to some sort of business gathering or go to, go, go to um, a take a course on business, some specific aspect of business or in the area that you want to provide your service or product. And then you can use your funds for a study, which you turn into market research. Now, in this case, right, you would say, okay, I want to do a study on precarity, job market precarity among academic women. If I was still um, at the university, I'm not anymore. And then of course, I would have to present the information at a conference. I would have to give them the deliverables they want, but I'm also kind of doing two things at the same time that I am getting information about the academic women that I'm hoping to serve as part of my market research. The other thing, leaves of absence. Um, if you can afford an unpaid leave, then do so. Now, I was hoping that one of the coaches from Kathy Mazak was going to come here. I actually studied with Kathy Mazak in 2019. She has an academic writing business and um, she took a leave of absence in order to build the business. And her business, I was watching it grow 
leaps and bounds. I think of Kathy Mazak often as being a mentor um, to me. I don't know if she knows that, but that's how I look at her. Okay, so she took a leave of absence. I don't know if it was an unpaid leave or not, or you could have your half year sabbatical, which is paid and think of the time to further develop your business. Of course, if you ask for these things, you have to then justify them, but think of ways that you can justify them in order to further your business and further your ideas. The other thing is, is do a SWOT analysis. And this was um, a business coach that I met um, here in my area who does small business coaching for women and minorities for free. Um, and this is the local small business association. He was had an office in my old university. And this is something that he did for me. And you can do it too. It's not that hard. I mean, SWOT analysis, right? You can find tons of resources on the internet. But the thing is, is that you would need to have somebody help you analyze it. And so you celebrate your, your strengths, but definitely address your weaknesses. How can you bolster your weaknesses? Can you take a class? Can you volunteer to get experience? Or can you partner with somebody who has the strengths that you lack? Okay, one of the people that I interviewed um, got a partnership with somebody and is now uh, is reaching her financial goals with this partnership that she developed with somebody. So the sky really is the limit as you start thinking about ways of building yourself up. Definitely shift your perspective. Start thinking like an entrepreneur. That research sitting half done on your computer, think of turning them into YouTube shorts. Right now, I have over 75 YouTube videos on my channel. I have an academic women playlist with seven. Um, and I'm going to, uh, this is going to be the eighth that I'm going to add. And then I have tons of ideas for more. Okay. Start thinking of building a passive income stream like, like Mary did, um, our professor of business who has um, decided on a niche that she was going to fill, something about marketing. And I don't know how many, um, how many YouTube videos she has. I, I, I believe it's well over 100. And she has over 1,000 uh, followers, 1,000 subscribers. That class that you always wanted to teach, but there was simply no spot for it turn it into a course that you develop, run, and populate. And that was probably one of the most empowering things that I did as an entrepreneur. I have my own class. It's called Self-Edit Academy. It's a class on helping middle and high school students write. And I didn't have any administrator to answer to. I didn't have any course, student course teaching evaluations. I had none of that. Of course, it's very challenging. I'm not going to lie to you. It's very challenging to market and sell a course like that, but I did it and I um, am really happy that I did. It was a very empowering experience. That scholarly tome that no longer interests you, find a way of turning it into a trade book or even a novel. Um, I dipped into two pots of money when I was an, uh, an academic in order to do research um, on my father's old neighborhood. And um, I, I did all the deliverables that they wanted, but instead of writing a scholarly article, a scholarly book, I, did, I have had a couple of articles, I turned it into a novel. And I finished that novel in May. And right now I'm working on my publication prospectus. I have a publisher I ha wanna get it out to, and then I'm gonna start querying literary agents. Okay, so um, this has been a lifelong dream. I, I don't really see it as being so central to my business, but it's social proof for my writing business. But you could, I wanna try to traditionally publish it, but you can self publish, you can hybrid publish. And I just want you to know there's people that make livings on their books. Uh, there is a woman sociologist that I follow. Her name is Patricia Levy. She is now a full-time novelist. She also writes academic books about um, using the arts in order to advance academic ideas. Um, but, the, but, but more typically are people that write 
romance novels or um, mysteries. Both of these genres are very, very popular and these books come and go very quickly. And so if you can write four of these books a year um, and you know exactly how to market yourself, uh, you can make a living doing this, okay? Develop your following and et cetera. Uh, it will take a while. <laughs> it's not the direction that I'm going, but I just wanna let you know that it is available and out there for you. It's just the beginning. There's just a few ideas here. I'm sure that everybody felt that they could say more, uh, Gina and Tanya. So let's share more in the discussion and thank you everybody for coming. And thank you, Tanya and Gina, for your wonderful presentations. Okay. So what kind of questions do we have? And people are putting up their um, LinkedIn. If anybody wants to put up their LinkedIn profile or other resources, they're putting them in the chat. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on these three little dots and I'm gonna save the chat before I get off, so. All right, what kind of questions do we have? So I'm gonna be selfish and I'm just gonna ask, when I gave you all my little scenario at the beginning, like Gina H and you were kind of like shaking your head, I'm just curious your thoughts <laughs> on, on where I'm at and where what suggestions you might have for where I should go. Does Tanya or Gina want to jump in on that? Well, I'm happy to have a go. I mean, Laura, what remind me of the situation, remind me what you you really are, where your questions really are. So should I should I stick it out in academia for a little while while building my consulting businesses? Or should I focus my time on getting a full-time DEI position that then I would learn and grow and build that kind of reputation there? to then eventually have my own like DEI consulting kind of thing. I, I sent my email list um, a meme last week. Um, I mean, I focus on people finishing their doctorate, right? And this particular little picture image was somebody celebrating that they've been offered a job that they really wanted and then realizing that they've still got to complete their doctorate whilst they're starting the new job. That's very much a trade-off, isn't it? Yeah, you, you want to build the network, you want to get the experience and build the professional knowledge. But the moment you step out of where you are, which is by definition reasonably comfortable, at least because you know what you're doing there, you've got a whole new set of skills and people and things to learn, processes, activities to learn, which is going to take at least some of your focus away from building the business. And it is a really hard trade-off. I mean, I, I, so there's something only you can do, but from my perspective, I, I counsel you to think about how deep is the pain you're in right now? And can you bear that? Can you carve the time out of that in order to build the business and spend more, more focus on the business? I mean, I, I took a slightly I'm in a very fortunate position that I've been able to step back from working full time as an academic. So I now work two days a week for one university, which I was in originally. I've been able to carve out my own time and choose what I do within those two days so that it works alongside the business. I've got support from my senior management to do the business. It fits with the, the, the university's ideals. Um, so that's really helped me because I, I felt that if I was to step into another new role, I would be spending so much time trying to catch up and get to know and get up to speed with what was happening there that I wouldn't be able to focus on building the business. And so it would take me backwards. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely does. Thank you. Yeah, for, for me, uh, I was kind of forced into retirement. I think that I've given you a little hint of how old I am. Right. And so I was forced into retirement. And now, of course, I have my retirement account. And I have Social Security and everything else. So um, I would like to have a part time job 
you know, just basically to get out of the house, but I am spending most of my time focused on my business and, um, you have to give it time. Uh, it, it, you know, unless you hit, it's, there are people that hit the jackpot right off the bat, but you do have to give it some time and you do have to build up your contacts and, and nurture your people. Um, and that is going to take a, a little bit of time. The, the, the answer to the question really is one only you can answer. Um, and that a lot of that is the stuff I talked about at the beginning, finding your why um, in terms of what it is that you want to do with your life, what's going to make you happy, right? Now, the, the rule is among entrepreneurs is don't leave your day job until your business takes over. So you're doing the right thing and staying in and working on building your consulting business, right? And I know there are people that are very successful. Uh, Naomi's, uh, Naomi has, I believe, a consulting business. She did her research your way, one of our, one of our videos. Um, there's people that are very, very successful in consulting, and, um, but it just, it does take a little bit of time, especially given the fact that you have another full-time job that you're, you're dividing your time with, uh, but don't, whatever it is you do, don't leave the day job until you're on your business is taken over. In my case, right. I have my retirement that I can, I can rely on. Okay. So, so, um, it would have been very hard for me to continue, trying to build up my entrepreneurial business with nothing else. So, but yeah, if you go in, it, 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 again, I think that if you spend some time thinking about your why, I think that will help you decide the path that you want to go. Yeah, Tanya, just, you have any, just, any yeah, suggestions? Yeah, I'm just going to share that. Um, yeah, and the why definitely comes into it. And as Gina H also said, how painful because it sounded I could sense some pain around like it just seems to be sucking the life out of you as <laughs> kind of the thing that I get and so um, as much as you can try to um, divorce that emotional component of just like focusing on like any aspect of it that you can find joy or at least some level of um, emotional equilibrium with will help um, but it also you know, because you said that you found this um, potential diversity and inclusion consulting thing. So, you know, part of it's going to be an analysis that how much time and money would you be able to, how much time would you have to expend for the money that you can gain? And as you start into this new field for diversity and inclusion work, um, and what does that look like in terms of how soon you can get up to speed with that? Um, it might be a little bit of a challenge to go completely on your own right now. So I think having that partner that you mentioned um, is a good segue into that role. And then, you know, I mean, if it's something that is just so painful to be there, looking at the financial resources to say, okay, how giving yourself kind of timing, okay, I'll stay here until here, but having some kind of marker point of, if you have the financial resources to be able to support other aspects of your life of rent or mortgage and putting food on the table. And if you have, you know, a family, like you making sure all of those things are in place and put away versus just from an emotional standpoint of being so fed up with it. Um, but I'd actually kind of be curious to like, to look at what aspects of it that are so painful. Is it the person you're reporting to? Is it the people that you're serving like so looking at all of those different aspects I would invite you to take that bank personality to see kind of what that is and maybe determine or even have them take it to like whoever those people that are involved um, so you could because part of it could just be a communication miss also and if you're able to know that okay this person is primarily this this or this of being able to cater your communication so it is not such a tenuous situation. Um, I'm kind of reading into it, so I don't know if exactly that is what is all entailed and why you're unhappy there. And I'm sure there's obviously more things, but if it's personality-based or 
um, related to the people that you're working with and or serving, that can be a good tool to help kind of mitigate some of that as well. And then, like I said, just trying to divorce yourself emotionally as much as possible and thinking about the end goal that you have of starting your own consulting business, because that can kind of also pull you through some of those challenging times as well of keeping the eye on the ball there. And um, yeah, so hopefully that helps. So much for your perspective. I appreciate it. Yeah. So Sarah, do you have any questions? Because the other two people have dropped off. That's fine. Hi. Um, I don't have any questions, but um, I do have some thoughts. And just to say thank you to everyone who presented today, because it was really useful. Um, as I said, I'm just starting the second year of my PhD, so and I'm full time. So this is this is me thinking about what I want to do next. But next is in you know, 18 months, absolute minimum, probably two years. Um, but this is going to be a great starting point. And that idea that I do need to start thinking about it now. I do need to start considering, um, you know, Gina H, as you said, um, who am I? What am I doing? What do I like doing? How do I, how do I like, um, what can I offer, basically? So you you talked about um, seeing the whites of the students' eyes. Um, my, my previous job before I started the PhD was um, running a tuition business and my partner was the person who liked to stand up and see the whites of the students eyes and he really took pleasure in being in front of all the students but he just you know the idea of how how do we market it how do we get everybody in the room what do you mean we've got to book a room make sure everybody comes at the same time you know that sort of organizational side of it he, he was less good at shall we say so we worked really well together that I love all that background stuff and okay let's let's make this happen a blueprint person let's how do we put this together what's the detail how do we um, make this go and be really successful so I think so you got me thinking that that's probably what I can offer so I can start putting that together um, and seeing you know how do I take that forward in a consultancy role so yeah just to say thank you it's been been really useful I have one more question for you all if you don't mind um how do you decide how to price your services? I mean, I feel like that's like a big thing, you know, and it's something that I talked to um, Al, the guy I do the DEI consulting with, and he always says that like, he's always amazed when he talks to women consultants who do the same thing, that they always underprice themselves. And then like, he told me like what he would offer for a service and what they offer for a service. And it's so much more and people don't even bat an eye. So like, how do you even know where to start with like, pricing services like like Gina like the class you said that you offer that's just like kind of out there online or you know I don't know I'm just always curious because again we we work for money like so I talking about the money aspect I think is really important yeah you know it is very personal and when I first started coaching I charged very small amount it was uh, beta pricing um and, uh, you know, I got my very first client with my beta price. I mean, she was, I, I hadn't coached anybody at all ever. And she took a chance on me. That was Kirsten. You could uh, see her video. Um, but here's the general rule, okay? Is that how much money do you want to make, you know, in, in the year? And so how much money a month? How many clients do you need to make that amount? And then that's how you come up with your price. Um, as you get uh, as you get more and more experienced, of course, you can raise your price. And as you get more and more known, you can raise your price. But essentially, it's what is it that you want to get? How many clients can you handle? Also, that will help you get to that point. And so that's why, you know, I mean, we all know coaches that charge $8,000 a client. It's because, you know, they may only want, you know, two, three clients per session, per cycle. And so they get $24,000 in six months, right? Or maybe more, who knows? But that's why they're charging so much because of they have a certain goal and they have a certain amount of bandwidth that they can spend with their client. So that's how you make the decision. Now, the other part of course is just personal, you know, how do you 
you know, how do you feel about yourself and all of that? That's all what's known as money mindset. And uh, you could just go to the web and find all kinds of YouTube videos on money mindset. And it also depends on who you're serving, Lauren, um, and the demographic makeup, economic makeup of those people that you're serving as well. With diversity and inclusion, that's corporate, right? So you would obviously be charging significantly more with corporate clients than you would just you know, Absolutely. individual one-on-one -on -one coaching. So that's a whole ball of wax that's completely different because that could be, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars um, for really just a short time that you're spending on them. So it really depends on who your audience is, the makeup of them, the demographics, the social um, economic aspect of them as well. Um, but from a corporate standpoint, it's going to be significantly higher than one-on-one -on -one individual coaching or even group coaching. Right. And you could have different offerings for um, different levels as well in terms of what it is that you're providing, kind of like different packages that you're putting together for them at different price points. So, yeah, that's right. Gina, can you chime in? Uh, it's just, uh, it's a really challenging question. I, I have struggled with this, I'll be really honest. Um, but I've taken my lead a little bit from my clients. So I started out with what I suppose you would term a beta pricing that I was, let's just start here and see what happens. Um, and every client that's finished sort of the process with me has said, you should be charging twice what you're charging me. So I've taken that as a bit of a cue and my prices have gone up accordingly. And, you know, and people keep coming in and every time I raise my prices, then I get two more coming in or four more coming in because it seems like that's the right thing to be doing. And the money mindset stuff is really important. It's not just what people will pay. And uh, one of the lessons I've learned is you should never, ever, ever, ever try to look in your client's wallet. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, and, you know, and don't sort of make that, well, they can't afford to pay this decision for people. Um, in my experience, if people want to work with you and they can't afford to work with you at the rates you're charging, they will come to you anyway and ask the question, or you can provide ways to for them to ask a question. So you can, if you feel that way inclined, you can amend that decision, that, that, that those rates at that point, some sort of bursary or some, some such. Um, but in general, yeah, absolutely. Women are so, so good at charging far less than a comparative male would charge um, and also really undervaluing what they're good at so I love the you know the idea of, of getting someone else to look at your SWOT analysis and uh, because then we don't we don't look at our own and focus on the weaknesses and actually you know we get someone to look at the strengths and really focus in on what those are and build those and improve those and charge for those yeah. and you're not charging for your hours time or your two hours time or your day in front of the group you're charging for the years of experience and knowledge that have gone in to getting you to that point. Um, and it is a real mindset thing in terms of how you do it and, and where you go and building the confidence to charge that. You know, and sometimes I find I put an offer out there and I just have to look the other way. I'm just like, just, just I'll wait for the notifications to come in and then I'll go, right, okay, that's, that's all right, that's all right. <laughs> and building that, that confidence from there. Yeah, it's hard, it's hard. Yeah, for sure. And to piggyback onto that, um, yeah, you, you can't assume what somebody can afford, right? And it's all going to be based on what they find to be valuable, how you are able to communicate that value to them and whatever problem it is that they're wanting to serve. But what I will say from, from a corporate standpoint, because that's kind of more of your direction, I would ask what their budget is. Mm -hmm to see, but obviously that's gonna be different on a one-on-one -on -one, like individual coaching, but from a corporate standpoint, they will appreciate you asking that question um, because if you come in so far out of target, um, then obviously that's, they're not gonna be able to even have wiggle room for negotiating with you. But also you don't wanna come in so under, like if, if you're coming in here, but your budget was like way up here, you just kind of mm -hmm. yourself. So right. finding out that key question is going to be key from a corporate standpoint. Mm -hmm. And if you're talking to somebody on the other end of the table, that is a blueprint, they will very much appreciate that. <laughs> right, Sarah? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, you know, the other thing that we all have to recognize, those of us who are in academia, is that the entire academy tries to devalue us. And in many, many ways, we accept that devaluation. And that's something that we have to fight to eliminate. Um, right. I know I did. And um, I'm probably still fighting to eliminate it. And so that's why I call my business Academic Women Reclaim Your Power, because I want us all to be more powerful women. And the way we do that is by supporting each other. This is how we do it. And that's why I have this meeting. So anyway, I am going to close things down um, because we have gone way over. Um, I am really though excited about what we did today. I thought it was an excellent event and it's going to have a new life on YouTube. <laughs> and um, and uh, I'll, you know, once I get it edited and everything, I'll give it to all of the participants, everybody who registered. And then um, you can all watch it again at your leisure and spread it around to people you think might need it. Okay, so I'd like to thank Gina H. and Tanya for coming and speaking. And I would like to take, thank all of the people who came here, but especially Lauren and Sarah who stuck it out to the end. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you all for doing this. Before you, before you let go, Gina, I have yeah. one more tip for Lauren. Just one. Yeah. Okay. Whatever pricing you feel comfortable with, right? Whatever that is with that, whatever package you put together, um, it would be a fun play for you to go 25% higher than that and throw that out as your first offer. Ah, uh, yeah. I like that. Good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so all much. Right, I really appreciate it. Oh, good luck with your studies as well. We'll see Thank you later. Bye-bye.